Hello and welcome to News Click. We, today we have with us Professor Langdon Winner, well-known commentator, historian of technology, also a philosopher of technology. I'm going to give you many titles. But today we're going to discuss with you, Langdon, something that you, we heard you speak a few days back about how you saw race, technology, and history play out in the United States, mm -hmm. particularly about the Industrial Revolution. So could you tell us, how do you see the, that one of the elements of the Industrial Revolution, according to you, was the cotton plantation and slavery? Yeah, well, the context was in studying uh, the history of te technology. I came from political science. And I got very much interested in the social and political dimensions of technology. So I began reading lots of history of technology, going back into the uh, 19th uh, century, into the 20th century. And the storyline was basically in, among conventional historians of technology. It had to do with inventors, new devices, new systems. It had to do with the, the uh, class relationships, moving away from small production to larger organizations. Uh, the, for example, the creation of new educational institutions to train up a managerial class educated in science and technology. And then you had the railroads and you had the telegraph and you had the chemical industry. That was, that was the whole story. And really until about 10 years ago for me that's what I understood. So I would draw upon that history. And then I ran across uh, some books about the Industrial Revolution in the United States that focused upon the key fact of chattel slavery in the history of the Industrial Revolution. This had not been much mentioned. People would talk about, oh, there were these plantations where they were growing cotton and so forth. Don't worry about that. You wanted to look at these new industrial managers and so forth. But it turns out, two, two crucial facts. One is that the capital value uh, in the middle 19th century of forces of production, the major force quantitatively was in the value of the bodies, that is if you could buy them, <clears throat> of uh, what turned out to be about four million black people. Right. So it was worth more than the factories, more than the railroads and so forth. The bodies as a capital, uh, we as capital wealth. The other thing was that, and uh, there are now uh, very good studies of this, the crucial uh, fo uh, focus of production in 19th century American uh, uh, production and, and capitalism was cotton, right? And it was not only cotton produced from the fields, but it was also shipped north. It was woven into cloth. It was what the shipping industry shipped around, around the world. And so the main source of wealth and a product, productive ability um, in the United States in the 19th century, uh, the true wellspring was uh, value extracted from black bodies. Uh, one cr crucial uh, aspect of this, particularly in the writings of historian Edward Baptist, his book is called significantly, The Half Has Never Been Told. He says the, perhaps the most important invention in the 19th century was a new bullwhip and what he calls the whipping machine. And the, um, the puzzle was, if you look at the statistics, beginning about 1820 in, in the United States in cotton production, <clears throat> productivity soars until uh, 1860 when the Civil War started and ended the, 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 the whole thing, at least in that configuration. So why was there a steady increase in productivity in cotton uh, production? That is, as measured by uh, pounds picked by a human being, man, woman, and children, uh, over that period of time. There were no new machines. Not there were new, no. There were, there were no man, new managerial techniques, but productivity per worker steadily and quickly uh, increased. And uh, what uh, Baptist in, in his book shows is that essentially you had extremely vicious forms of whipping. He calls it the whipping machine, right? And what happened was people uh, were uh, uh, forced day by day to increase their production. Men, women, children, yeah. This other uh, corollary to that yeah. was also the calculation at what age 
the slave was no longer quote unquote productive and therefore his value was enough has been extracted right. and he could then be disposed of. And it was calculated in completely capitalist terms that about say 26, 27 or 28, that's the end of his, uh, what shall we say, surplus production. And yeah. therefore at that point that he could be disposed of. Is that right. correct? That, that, is, that is true. The older you got, the less you, the less you picked. But what eventually what seems to have happened was the vicious whipping of the bodies of, of black people turned them into um, the, the old-fashioned uh, unproductive technique. You had a bag and you'd carry it along and you'd pick and put it in, pick it and put it in. But apparently what happened was that <clears throat> through intense whipping, punishment, cruelty, uh, you got... Uh, African Americans going through the fields of, of cotton plants and they were picking with both hands and putting it in there. They became uh, human automatons. That's how product productivity uh, increased. So my uh, uh, relationship to the history of technology in the United States, I talked to my historian friends now and they'd say, why didn't you tell me about that? You were talking about, you know, the schools like the one I now teach in, a big engineering school. They needed to train up these manager engineers. You're an engineer, you know this, you know this part of the story. But it was not part of the history of technology for in much of my experience. So I feel uh, offended, actually. That we are missing, in fact, even globally, that industrial revolution in England comes with the colonial plunder, uh, genocide, slavery, all this yeah. accompanies. Cotton. Shall we say? Right. Cotton. All you need to know is one word. What was, the, what was this industrial revolution about? What was this nice stuff they wove into cloth and so forth? So if you look at sort of the banks, uh, the shipping industry, the factories, the universities, the colleges, if you go into their records, they were all heavily invested in cotton. That's what this, the source of is like in, today. It's all in you know digital electronics and so forth. Then it was the you know the cotton industry. Coming back to the race relationship yeah. in the United States, because that's what uh, we are discussing today. Mm -hmm. After slavery, there was, or shall we say, when slavery is abolished as a consequence of the Civil War. There was a feeling that, well, now we have entered a new stage of emancipation, that we will get unity. But that's not what really happens. That's right, yeah. In fact, uh, the con basic conditions of oppression of African American people, black bodies, continued. You had a period about 10 years of Reconstruction, and then there was a revolt against that. And during Reconstruction, you actually had African Americans serving in Congress and in state legislatures and so forth. But then that was shut down through a series of, of, of reforms. But on the ground, uh, where you, you had um, uh, people released from slavery, many of them became sort of, sort of loosely uh, linked to any kind of economic and social life. And then you had the uh, invention, invention of other forms of oppressive uh, work relations, where let's say you were unemployed, <clears throat> vagrant on the streets, and so forth. You would be arrested, given a long-term sentence, and they formed uh, prison chain gangs, basically. So on very minor charges, you would be imprisoned, uh, <clears throat> put back into chains, and, and, and put to work, uh, so that the public institutions, the prisons, would rent out the labor of, 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 of black people, right? A different form of slavery. It was a new, for, a new form of slavery. And then as you move through the 19th century and the 20th century, you had the creation of what we call Jim Crow, Jim, we call it now Jim and Jane Crow, uh, segregation. So, so throughout society, you had the separation, the color line between white and black. And this affected housing, schools, uh, workplaces, transportation, and so. So, in, in effect, you had systems of oppression over the decades that were again and again um, uh, reinvented. So they were sort of changed, modified, but sort of reappears in a different form. Would that be the right? And point? often, uh, quite invisibly, <clears throat> uh, people would not talk about it. it it wasn't described. You know, you had great thinkers like W.E.B. W. E. B. Du Bois and so forth who were writing and, and, and talking about this. And in a way, there was, there was a certain kind of um, denial about what, what was going on 
uh, I teach my engineering students a book about the American swimming pool. And this started out as pools where the working class could get clean, and then after a while the middle class, whites, um, got interested in the exercise. It was thought that uh, in, uh, people working in offices were getting flabby. You move through time, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, you had public pools for males in which people of different classes and color swam together uh, harmoniously. Then at a later point, swimming pools became a kind of social fad, so they built in thousands of towns and cities leisure pools in which there was no longer separation of male from female. That used to be forbidden, but now you could have mom and dad and the kids come into these big public pools. They were public places, part of public life. And what happened, especially in the 1920s, uh, was it, when these new pools went up, African Americans were kicked out, excluded. So you had segregation expressed there, informally off times, <clears throat> but it was just known that black people couldn't come there. Why? Uh, whites thought that males were, uh, black males were sexually aggressive and could not be in the water with, with white women and children. Uh, so this was another case in which very subtly the country divided along racial lines. It wasn't much talked about. There weren't movements and so forth. <clears throat> but eventually this, these patterns of segregation in the South, they were uh, inscribed in laws. This, these people will be kept uh, apart. You would have separate but equal schools, for example. But even, even in the North, um, the pattern was basically that of eventually of white flight. So they move, whites moved from the city, they built these wonderful roads, they built these wonderful suburbs, and they were mainly havens of, of whiteness. So then you get, again get um, uh, re-encoding of oppressive racial r relationships. And of course those uh, erupted in the civil rights movement uh, throughout the century, but really <clears throat> with the successes of the 1960s. That's the other issue. The civil rights movement, again, yeah. was a point where we, one would have thought that there is this possibility of emancipation, at least in racial, racial right. terms. There would be a kind of equalization, affirmative action, acceptance that there has been this racial discrimination, and therefore a move by the state also to end the, at least some of the worst forms of it. Right. But do you see also the recreation of a similar kind that happened with the end of slavery and the reconfiguration under segregation, a similar kind of thing happening? Yes, you do. And you actually see it throughout the, um, the 20th century. <clears throat> um, what, it, what happened was in uh, crucial pieces of progressive legislation <clears throat> during our New Deal, you would say, well, people get housing support, more, uh, the government would back up their mortgages and so forth. But it turns out these were racially encoded. <clears throat> so you had the practice of, <clears throat> of redlining. <clears throat> we'd say, if you live inside the red line, let's say a brown and black neighborhood, your, uh, your mortgage would be too risky. So you couldn't um, uh, buy a house. <clears throat> it turns out today in the United States, uh, in, as regards income earned in a job, <clears throat> African Americans tend to earn less than whites, but the, the gaps are sort of closing. But if you look at wealth, uh, the amount of assets you own, <clears throat> whites have far more, black families tend to have very little because over the decades they were blocked out, even in the North, from buying houses. That's the way Americans uh, uh, ac accumulate capital. You have a house, you bought it for 50,000 bucks, your kids can sell it for 200,000 when you die and so forth. <clears throat> but these institutionalized uh, structures in finance, housing, schools, and so forth uh, were uh, institutional barriers. So mm -hmm. Some of the arguments have been that you're more likely to fall into poverty even if you had a certain kind of income, or children of such families, even they are more prone, prone to fall into poverty than if you're white 
or if you are black. So the difference is maintained because of the housing. That's what right, the, and 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 the schools also. I mean, because it, the uh, 1956 decision, a crucial Supreme Court decision, forbid. Uh, <clears throat> uh, legal uh, segregation of schools. But then you had white flight. So you got, you know, the whites moving to the suburbs. Uh, schools are paid for by tax levels. If you're in a prosperous community, your school is well equipped. The salaries are good for teachers. If you're caught back in the city where the tax rates are, are not, so, not so favorable, you get crummy schools, crummy equipment, and so forth. So you are institutionally and in built form also <clears throat> reproducing uh, uh, race relations of, of an extremely nasty kind. Well, there's also been this argument that drugs, the war on drugs was really a coded war against the black community, African American community. And also the prison sentences, the three strike laws, and the various other criminalization of even petty offenses of a, a, of a kind which meant that they went in for long periods is that also part of this pattern of recreating, shall we say, racial barriers? Oh yes, definitely. Because <clears throat> after the victories of the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act and so forth, <clears throat> um, the uh, forces in the North and the South that were resistant to <clears throat> the advancement of African Americans uh, were looking for new ways to justify, again, the, the, the create, recreation, the reinvention of what you had in slavery, what you had after Reconstruction, what you had in Jane, Jane, uh, uh, Jim and Jane Crow segregation. So in the, the coming of the drug culture, which I saw as a hippie in, in San Francisco in the 60s, <clears throat> um, didn't use any myself, of course, but drugs were coming in and becoming quite controversial. There was a kind of drug panic. And what happened was that if you were uh, a white person in uh, the suburbs or whatever, if you had a little bit of powder or a, a marijuana cigarette or whatever, you get called in and the judge would say, well, uh, let's not do this. You're, you're on probation for a year and, and so forth. You'd have a lawyer. Uh, <clears throat> they would argue your case. This is, Johnny is actually a good boy, right? But if you were an inner city African-American youth, male or female, <clears throat> uh, you didn't have a lawyer. You couldn't pay, pay for a lawyer. And you'd go in to, to face the justice system. And they'd say, <clears throat> uh, for drug possession or sales or whatever, um, uh, five years in jail. And, and very often what would happen, the, the district attorney would come and say, well, um, uh, you're going to plead not guilty, right? <clears throat> but, you know, you could, uh, if you f are found guilty of having <clears throat> possession of cocaine or whatever, crack, uh, you could get a very long sentence. Say, but I, I didn't have this stuff. I'm not guilty, Your Honor. They say, they, well, we'll do a plea bargain. So instead of serving 10 years, you'll only get two. And that was what happened again and again in the justice system, right? And you have uh, a wonderful book written by uh, Michelle Alexander, who is, uh, has documented all of this. And it's essentially the reinvention of racial oppression in the context of the drug war. The drug war was ultimately a war, an incarcer mass incarceration of young black people. We know for also from political records, memoirs and so forth of people, that this was among key political leaders in the United States, an explicit strategy. Nixon's you know. aide has written about it, <clears throat> talked yeah. about using marijuana against the left because a lot of the anti-war movement were hippies supposedly and therefore into marijuana culture. Yeah. And of course, hard drugs against the uh, African-American community and the combination of these two is also what leads to the state taking a right. hard position against the right, left and delegitimizing them as hippies. And the second is of course the longer term effect consequence of the African-American population, a large amount of the young people being put into jails. Yeah, And <clears throat> there were distinctions made if you had a uh, nice powder cocaine and you were <clears throat> sniffing it in a suburban home. That was one thing. <clears throat> if you were using much cheaper crack cocaine uh, in, in the cities, this was thought to be, it was, it was described as a, uh, uh, an epidemic 
young children growing up in crack houses and so forth. And so, of course, you needed to send people involved there off to jail for long periods of time. So there was even, there's no difference really in the high or, <clears throat> you know, the effects on the body from cocaine in powder or crack cocaine as this specially chemically prepared substance. But it hit um, the African com community uh, much harder. The, the other interesting thing, and this has arisen recently with the, the Black Lives Matter movement, another way in which, yet again, these same reinventions of oppression have emerged is that in the uh, policing system, which really came also out of slave patrols in the Deep South and so forth, and you have white people policing black bodies and so forth, in, in the last 10 years or so, <clears throat> uh, what happens, it, well, let me put it this way. If I'm driving my car and my head, uh, taillight is out, the, co the cop will pull me over. I stop, roll down the window, and he said, uh, <clears throat> let me see your license and so on and so forth. He says, did you know your taillight was out? I said, no, I didn't. He said, oh, well, uh, I'm not going to give you a ticket or anything today, but as soon as you can, get to the shop and fix your taillight. <clears throat> Thank you, officer. Good night. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But if you're an African-American, young man especially, uh, they'll pull you over and uh, hassle you. And, uh, and very often in recent years, what happens is you have these encounters between young African-Americans, uh, mainly men, but some, some women also, um, where there's a, um, a, a, some kind of verbal altercation, and the next thing you know, somebody's been shot dead on the, on the streets, Ferguson, Missouri, and, and so these incidents still continue. Tasered if we're lucky, if we're lucky shot. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, the, that's the pattern of a lot of these encounters. Right. And um, so in, uh, interesting social movements in the, in the United States are including, uh, include the Black Lives Matter movement, which say, why are we getting so many young people for no reason at all shot and killed uh, <clears throat> for a, a traffic violation or, <clears throat> or just walking down the street, crossing the street at the wrong point? Bang, you're dead. And, you know, this is, uh, it's, it's erupted as a concern. Yeah. Now, last issue over here, that one of the strengths, as it were, of the ruling class classes, and that's true everywhere, is the ability to divide the people to oppress. So do you see that the white working class who have been dispossessed, lost jobs, are in the margin today, and the African-American community mm -hmm. who have also, who have been, of course, uh, discriminated at different points of time in different ways, that there is a potential of coming together because Trump seems to be also appealing to, shall we say, the white dispossessed and while the, while the African-American community is, of course, not his constituency at all. Mm -hmm. Do you see the potential of coming together? coming together? Because you for, young, for young people, yes, because they live in a world of diversity. There's diversity of eth ethnic background, skin color, and, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, in, my, in my experience, especially among uh, better educated young people, <clears throat> these, these are not issues. In fact, they rather celebrate the newly diverse America. But then you get people who are, uh, especially in rural communities where maybe there weren't people of color around, uh, who are resistant to this. And the Trump supporters, many of them are whipped up by anti-immigrant, which is also coded language for brown people coming and taking your uh, jobs. Social scientists have been busy after Trump's election saying, what really happened? And it turns out it wasn't economic differences and, or even uh, <clears throat> income and jobs that were, was bothering people. It was what sociologists and anthropologists call social status anxiety. So you have this sense that you had a place in society, now are there these others moving up that are going to knock you off the position that you, you held. So it's a kind of cultural panic about your place in, in, the, in the hierarchy. I know you have similar uh, issues here which I know nothing about having to do with caste. <clears throat> but yes. in, in the United States, many of these same um, issues show up on, as... Uh, um, uh, worries about 
being under assault by strange people coming to get what you have. Langdon, it's an interesting discussion we're having because these are precisely the kind of anxiety, shall we say, we all, the, shall we say, a section of the population suffers from. And the consequences increase of hate, divisiveness, and also politically, a certain section being instigated against others. So divisiveness is fostered by certain political forces, right. just as in the United States is a phenomena here, is a phenomena in Europe, and we seem to have come back to a phenomena where race in India, caste is very caste. similar to race because it's descent-based discrimination. You are what you are, discriminated against because of your parents. So right. that's mm -hmm. the common element. And right. we seem to be the see worldwide the eruption of nationalism, ethnic nationalism of different kinds, right. racial nationalism. Racism. Mm -hmm. All of this seems mm -hmm. to be the cauldron that we are seeing different nation states yeah, pass. It's, a, it's a great challenge of, of how to deal with this. In my own country, it turns out the less contact you have with a, 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 pers a, different, uh, a person of different background, maybe skin color, the more you are worried about them. Anxiety is even more. <laughs> and, and, and the closer contact you have with them, let's say in, 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 in cities and so forth, the anxiety goes down because you might end up saying, oh, they're just, you know, people like you and me. Uh, we can, we can le learn to live with them, which is, which is, of course, the great challenge. Uh, the problem is, is as, you, as you said, uh, that you have people who mobilize fear, resentment, anxiety, uh, for po political reasons in order to uh, gain power. Since we both of us are pretty old, uh, you are a little older than me, <laughs> we live in hope that hate will, cannot, the society cannot, society cannot succumb to hate, but the short run, hate can be pretty successful in politics. That's what we seem to see currently around the world, probably also because of other instabilities aiding this, this kind of process. Yeah. Langdon, Pleasure to have you with us, and we hope to see you in India again. Thank you very much. This is the time, this is all the time we have for News Click today. Do keep watching us, and we'll bring you other episodes of similar kind.